Welcome to the National Press Club Newsmakers News Conference today. I'm Iron Belkine, President of the Press Club and today's event coordinator. I'm also joined by Frederica Dunn, a colleague from the Board of Governors who has made four trips to Cuba and indeed led the first uh, Press Club journalist trip to Cuba in the year 2000. Today we are discussing a topic known as the Cuban Five and their impact on U.S.-Cuban relations. The Cuban Five were among a group of Cuban intelligence agents dispatched to Cuba in the 1990s to infiltrate Miami-based militant exile groups believed to be plotting terrorist attacks against Cuba. The U.S. government arrested the five agents, three of whom remain in prison. This is happening at a pretty interesting time. Uh, there seem to be a lot of fast-moving and, and maybe hopeful developments in relations between the United States and Cuba. And I speak of the uh, delegation last week from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that were in Havana. And last month, uh, we had the letter to President Obama signed by a diverse group of 44 Republicans, Democrats, uh, including people from the Bush administration, calling for change in U.S. policy. There are presently, there is presently an application before the judge who rendered the conviction. And that application deals with the use of the media uh, during the, during the uh, trial of the Cuban Five. Uh, we have here, in the event that you want to look at it, selected documents from those court papers. The judge can rule on this any day. What happened in this case is unprecedented in American legal history. What we have learned is the following. In September of 2006, the Miami Herald fired six reporters when the Miami Herald learned that the reporters who were covering the case were on the payroll of the American government. Over the last two years, there has been an extraordinary, laborious process where we went through government documents and through the history of many of these journalists. What we learned was that tens of millions of dollars were spent from 1996, the time of the shootdown, until 2001, the time of the conviction, and money was spent thereafter. What we learned was that there were 1,932 days from the time of the shootdown until the time of the conviction. There were five articles a day during that nearly 2,000-day period that was written by people who received American government monies. When the Miami Herald broke the story, the Washington Post picked it up, with respect to six journalists, the New York Times picked it up, and it was picked up nationally. At the time this case was tried, the neither the defense lawyers nor any of the defendants <laughs> knew that this was going on. Now, the, it was not just a question of journalists on the Miami Herald. It was journalists on a variety of papers in Miami. That was one of the factors. And what you found is that the stories that were in these various newspapers, when you're talking about dozens and dozens of journalists, both in the Spanish-American press and in the American press, you're talking about journalists who worked for the print media, you're talking about journalists who were employed by NBC and CBS, as well as Spanish-speaking stations there. Just to sort of give you a, a sense of the kinds of stories that we're talking about here. This is a day after the initial charges were laid. So September, I think, 14th of, of 1998, uh, a journalist with El Nuevo Herald, uh, Pablo Alfonso, insinuated without offering any evidence that the FBI arrests, quote, may be an action aimed at preventing a possible collaboration between the Cuban government and countries involved in terrorist actions against the United States. Now, I don't know. I, uh, most of you are journalists in this room. I don't know how you would get away with uh, writing something like maybe without offering any concrete evidence. Certainly, it wouldn't pass uh, Journalism 1001 uh, in my school. And a week later, 
Uh, he then turned around and resurrected Cold War rhetoric to suggest that the idea to send Cuban spies en masse to Miami was developed more than three decades ago. This is the Cuban Five being sent to Miami in the 1990s, and this was developed three decades ago in the Georgian city of Pitsunda in the old Soviet Union during a post-Cuban missile crisis conversation between Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev and Fidel Castro. I mean, these things are bizarre, but this guy was paid $58,600, and that's what, I, what, what uh, I knew when I wrote the book. I don't know if there was more since then. 256, $256,000. I'm sure most of you would like a little freelance money like that. <laughs> the papers that we have submitted to the court name specific journalists, name specific monies they got, and it tells you where they got, the, which agencies they got the monies from, and it also includes the articles and statements that they made, and it shows the relationship between, let's say, Radio Marti's analysis of the facts and the stuff that then winds up in the Miami Herald and on national, uh, on local N NBC and CBS uh, stations. And we also go through the relationships between some of the journalists and what their politics was. And the amazing thing is the number of people whose names are on articles who had never written a word before. But they then come out and they write dozens and dozens of articles. It's clearly the United States, uh, the president has the, the, the power uh, to pardon, to, to issue clemency. Uh, we've seen that he has been able to, in the, in the case of the American soldier, uh, circumvent uh, other, other rules to, to, in fact, do that. There is an opportunity here. The only way that opportunity is actually going to happen if there's some sort of a reset press on relations between the two countries. And I think that, that could happen uh, if, in fact, you can, you can engineer some sort of, of humanitarian trade. And, and the Cubans have said that they're willing to do that without preconditions, that they're willing to sit down and talk about this. Uh, it seems to me that, that uh, if there are no preconditions, then there is no reason why the United States should not at least sit down and talk about this.